Hi, David Brandon here, disability lawyer and founder here at Resolute Legal. This week on Disability Perspectives, we're going to be talking with Doug Runchy. Doug is a former employee of Human Resources Development Canada, now known as Employment and Social Development Canada. That is the new name for it. This is the this is the government department that runs the CPP Disability Program. He worked there for uh, 30 or more years, I think he said, in the pension department. He is one of the first people that I found years ago to write online explaining how CPP disability is calculated, how CPP is calculated, different insights into the program. He was one of the first, if I think the first person to kind of publish how it worked. I called it like he gave away the caramel secret. Uh, he continues to give great content for anyone who's doing retirement planning, and that does kind of link over into CPP disability as well. You're going to be able to find Doug's website down below. Now, he is retired, but he does continue to do consulting and does consulting with people who are doing retirement planning and also does consulting with our law firm, frankly, when we're trying to calculate uh, what our client's CPP disability might be for different legal cases and things like that. So... Without further ado, we're going to get into this. We're going to get into this episode, but I do want to give you a heads up. Listen to the end because perhaps the best nugget comes right at the end when he gives us a, another uh, insider scoop that I probably will be writing a blog article about, actually. But you're going to be able to hear it right at the end. Let's go to the video right now. Welcome everyone to this this edition of the Disability Perspective, CPP Disability Perspective. We have Doug Runchy on the line today. He's going to be talking with us about everything about CPP disability, how it's calculated, and I'll I'll let Doug tell you a bit about his background. But it is quite a, a proper background to be talking about this uh, this topic. And I, I've known Doug for a few years now, basically getting work done in around CPP disability. And we, my firm has actually used him to answer very specific questions that come up in the legal context. So Doug, just tell us a little bit about your background and uh, how it is you know something about CPP disability. Well, I worked for approximately 33 years with income security programs, Canada Pension Old Age Security, and at one point in time, Family Allowances was included in there as well. Um, so I worked from age 18, basically, till I retired at age 50. Uh, all of that time with income security programs, a lot of different capacities, uh, started in the file room and worked my way up to a middle management type position. Got to be uh, known, I think, with started in the Manitoba region, ended up in the BC Yukon region. Uh, and became known, I think, as a bit of a legislative expert and a calculations expert within the uh, Canada Pension Plan program. I retired from the government, uh, it's getting to be a while back now, 2003, uh, and started a, a second career with the Home Depot. Uh, and it was there that I really found out that people don't know much about CPP. I had worked with it for 33 years, so it was second nature to me, but uh, I found out how uh, little was known in the general public uh, about Canada Pension Plan, so started helping other Home Depot associates with understanding their entitlement, uh, and then realized, hey, maybe my third career should be uh, doing this as a business, so about seven years or so ago now i started my own consulting business um, mostly around canada pension plan and calculation of benefits and that uh, a little bit around old age security but there, there's less questions typically about the old age security than there is about the canada pension plan and i'll say uh, your your uh, business name is dr pensions consultant. DR, yeah, DR Pensions Consultant. We'll put a yeah. link down below so people can go check that out. And I highly encourage anyone who has a question. Um, you have, you're very reasonable in your rates and, and what you charge for these kind of consultations and things like, well, worth your money to pay for one of these consultations to under, better understand because it is pretty difficult 
to, especially if you have retirement planning. Sure. And as we'll find out, I, I've read a lot of your articles and things that it can make a huge difference, even a few years or making different decisions. So I find that very fascinating. I didn't know that part of your story that you were at, you, you just went into retirement. I'll do some Home Depot thing. And right. so you were running into people with all kinds of it just, they didn't understand what their rights were or what kind of problems were they running into? Did you find? Well, yeah, as I say, just talking with my coworkers at the Home Depot and and a whole array of problems, uh, uh, they wouldn't know when's the best time to apply for my retirement pension. Should I take it now? Should I wait another couple of years? Right. What's going to happen? I mean, a, a lot of them were in the same thing where they had uh, had a career, had been working full time, and now at the Home Depot it was just a part time gig. And how does that affect your benefit? Does it go down if you wait? Does it go up if you wait? A lot of those things around CPP credit splitting is it? There's oh, yeah. some big issues around the CPP credit splitting, and how that affects the the benefits. So that's again one fairly large component of of the consulting that I do is to calculate the impacts of a credit split before they apply for it. Because once it happens, it's, it's done forever. It can't be undone under most situations. So all, all manner of things. Honestly, I, this is kind of a, a urban legend. Like when you go to Home Depot, the people working, you don't realize it's former CEOs. Like it is, yeah, quite, I mean, yeah it is insane. Sure, yeah, no, there, there's a real mix of people. Yes. And yeah, it's a I, good representation of the Canadian public, I think. It really is. Yeah, it really is. And, and I, I I had known of that, that uh, it, I wouldn't say it's an urban legend, but it, it is kind of well known that you've got a lot of people in retirement. This is, this is something you're doing because you enjoy it. Uh, the Home Depot is great because there's an edu- big emphasis on education, which is part of what yeah. you... I know that you value that. Now, you also write uh, at Retire Happy, I believe. You're one of the, you do, you're a contributing author there? Yeah, when I first started my business, I, I was just commenting on a lot of the articles that Jim Yee wrote and, and responding and, and answering questions that came in from the public on, on Jim's behalf. I was getting to the questions before Jim had a chance and I was providing the answers. And then Jim approached me at some point and said, hey, do you want to start writing couple of articles for us and that for a number of years I, I wrote typically one a month sort of thing and I've got 20 or 30 articles on, on the Retire Happy website now. I, I never intended to get into full-time consulting work because mm-hmm. sort of semi-retired uh, and just looking to both share my knowledge and bring in a little bit of income and and that was always my intention sort of thing. I can't say enough good things about Jim. I don't know Jim personally, but as somebody in the, what I would call the professional services education space, he's certainly right. a pioneer in Canada. He, I share a lot of values with him. He was, his site is, if, for those of you who don't know, it's called Retire Happy. We'll put a right. link to it. Awesome site. And Jim is somebody who I have a lot of respect for because he's in the cutthroat industry of financial investing. And right. he's very transparent. Like you can tell right away that this is a very different site. He has a different philosophy. So I would encourage people to go check out that site. Yeah, uh, I agree. Yeah. In fact, the first time, and I, I we kind of laughed about this before we hit record, but I found you, I found one of your article that I found was on, I think it was on Retire Happy. When I started out with CPP Disability, there was hardly anything published online. There was one or two textbooks out there, but it, very difficult to find any information about how the program worked, how to do appeals and these kind of things. But one of the things that always stymied me was how do they calculate the benefit amount? And I gave you a lot of credit. Now, I think this is at least four years ago or five years ago that I stumbled on your article. I wrote my own article citing your article saying, yeah. I have found the caramel secret for you guys old enough to remember the caramel secret. Cause I think you were at least that I could find, you were the first person that I found that actually explained how the calculation worked. And I noticed since then, Revenue uh, Service Canada now has it on their site, but you really were the first. And I don't think it was a state secret, if I'm correct. Like that. Yeah, no, it it shouldn't have been a state secret, at least anyway. I wondered at the time when I wrote that article, (laughs) like my consulting business is built around doing CPP calculations. Am I giving away the farm by putting this out there? But it, it, it is probably actually brought in a lot of business because people, okay, now I understand it. I still don't feel comfortable enough to do it though. 
but you've convinced me that you know how, so how now I'll pay you to do it. So it's, it's brought in much more business than it might have taken away from me. As a business that's been built, my Resident Legal has been built on giving away free information. In fact, like we didn't actually grow and become a, a, a real successful business until we started really embracing giving away free and everything. We give it all away. So I completely agree with you there. It's more that people know they can trust you. And just because you know the calculation, it's more complicated than that. But just so we can tell everybody, because one of the it is one of the most high trafficked search terms for a CPP. It's one of the most popular articles we have is how to calculate the CPP disability benefit. So if, if you were talking, if someone's watching this, the highest level, how is it calculated? What, what goes into, if someone's saying, well, what was my CPP disability going to be based on? How is it calculated? Well, the, the disability calculation itself is fairly simple. It's 75% of what your calculated retirement pension would be, plus a flat rate benefit. Right. And the flat rate benefit is just a little over $500 a, a month now, 505 79 uh, for 2020. Th that's how complicated or simple the, the, the calculation of the retirement pension is a little bit more complicated. Uh, and again, it's become more complicated still with the enhanced CPP that started in 2019. But prior to the enhanced, basically, again, in simple terms, what the retirement pension was intended to be was it was 25% of your average lifetime earnings. Uh, and, and that's what you would get back in the form of a retirement pension if you took it at age 65. Uh, and again, there's several steps into calculating what your 25% of your average lifetime earnings would be. So the, the goal behind CPP then was it wasn't to give you a full retirement like that someone could live on as their own income, I guess. It was meant, uh, it sounds like it was like a 25% was meant to be a supplement maybe. Is that, what was the- Yeah, it was like? intended for, for the most part uh, and- depends on the book you look at, but mm -hmm. there was, they would use a stool analogy and there's three legs to a stool or, or different things. So there was different components of it. Mm -hmm. The Canada pension plan was supposed to be one of these legs to the stool. Uh, the old age security was a right. second leg. And, and then there's uh, private pension plans and or personal savings, uh, such as RRSPs and that. So those were the three legs of the stool or, or the three ba the base of a pyramid. And however you look at it, they were, they, they were designed to be the, the three components uh, of, of a retirement plan and the CPP uh, I don't know whether, whether it's a third of it, but it's one of the three components. Right. Uh, and, and the maximum retirement pension plan. And, and again, that was all based on earnings up to a certain level, which is called the YMPE or year's maximum pensionable earnings. So it didn't cover, uh, right now that's just under $60,000. So if you're earning $200,000, it's not gonna replace 25% of your 200,000 because you stop paying contributions once you re your earnings reach the ceiling. So the benefit you get back doesn't include anything above the YMPE. So 25% of your average monthly pensionable earnings was what a retirement pension was intended to be. With the enhanced CPP, that is increasing up to 33.33%. So instead of 25%, it's moving up to a third of your earnings up to the YMPE. And then again, the ceiling is going a little higher under the enhanced. Uh, there's going to be the YMPE is still going to exist there as as this ceiling for for some people, but there's going to be an extra level above that called the year's additional uh, maximum pensionable earnings, and that's going to be 14% above the YMPE. Uh, so again, and a third of those earnings will be replaced, but that's over a 45 year transition period uh, for the enhanced. So it's going to be a long time before anybody receives that fully enhanced. No, that makes sense. Uh, let's do this. I, I wouldn't mind you explaining like as a really at a high level, 
how the CPP retirement is calculated. And if you could, you've mentioned this enhanced. Why don't we start with that and then you move into the calculation? So it started in 2019 was the first year uh, that you started to pay a little bit more. The CPP contribution rate has been, it started out at 1.8%. So that's how much you were paying in 1.8% of your earnings after the year's basic exemption and below the YMPE. Uh, and that was for about the f first 20 years or so of the plan starting in 1966 up till around 86. Mm -hmm. and, and then they started, they, there was all kinds of talk about the CPP going broke and running out of money. They increased the contribution rate fairly significantly over about a 10 year period from the 1.8% up to 4.95%. And that's where it's been for the last 10 or 15 years. Uh, now the enhanced was saying, okay, CPP maximum benefit 25%. Uh, some people, or a, a lot of people, I guess, weren't necessarily doing much with that third leg of the stool, the personal savings uh, and RRSP sort of thing. So uh, the government thought maybe we need to make the CPP a little bit bigger portion to make sure that everybody's got a better base uh, on the CPP. So let's move it up from 25% earnings replacement to 33.33 and see how that works. So started, as I say, 2019 was the first year they started to increase the contribution rate and, and they're trying to make sure the enhanced benefits are fully funded. So they're, they're even this first step in it is over a five year transition period, 2019, they increased it by 0.15% of the planned 1% increase to the contribution rate. So it's going from 4.95 to 5.95% of your earnings for an employee, double that for a self-employed. Because uh, the employer, for an employee, the employer pays the same uh, contribution rate as an employee. If you're self-employed, you pay both uh, shares of that. So it's a five-year transition uh, phase before they get up to full 1% increase for the enhanced. At the same time, the benefits started to go up, but it's a 45-year transition period before anybody will see, receive that full 33.33%. Because when I said earlier, uh, the CPB retirement pension is 25% of your average monthly pensionable earnings. Uh, that's taking your earnings right from when you turned 18. That's when everybody's contributory period starts now. Used to be either January 1966 or when you turned age 18. For most people, that, that now means it started when, uh, on uh, the month following your 18th birthday. And it goes from there till whenever you become eligible for a benefit. That's the first thing that could stop your contributory period running. So if you start your CPP at age 65, that's a 47 year period from age 18 to age 65. And that whole period of time, whether you were working, whether you were living in Canada, whatever you were doing, that's all considered part of your contributory period. It all affects the amount of your CPP benefit, except for some dropout provisions. The first step in, in calculating the amount of your benefit is looking at your contributory period, see how long it is. Are you starting your benefit at age 60, 65, or 70, determining the length bringing all of your earnings up to a current year value uh, so that uh, you don't, in averaging, you don't say, let's take your 10,000 earnings from 1966 <laughs> and add it to a $60,000 earnings. So you have to make sure everything's relative. You take whatever portion of the YMPE your earnings were in, when you were age 18, that gets brought up to uh, the equivalent. So 10,000, like in, in 1966, the YMP was uh, $5,000. So if your earnings were $5,000 in 1966, that's equivalent to 58,700 in 2020. So you bring all those earnings up to a current year value then you look at the, the various dropout provisions. Everybody's entitled to drop out their lowest 17% of their earnings. Uh, so again, if you take it at age 60, that's a little over seven years. 
if you take it at age 65, that's eight full years that you, everybody gets to drop out. So maybe you had some low income years when you were attending school or university, and uh, maybe you retired early at age 55, you'll get to drop out your lowest eight years for whatever reason. Then the other main dropout, two other main dropouts, one is what's called the child rearing provision or child rearing dropout years. So if you were the primary caregiver for a child under age seven and you had low zero or low earnings, you can drop out those years. Uh, and then one of the other major dropouts is the disability dropout provision. If you're disabled and receiving a CPP disability benefit, that period of time is excluded from your contributory period. So it doesn't reduce your overall average uh, lifetime earnings and it doesn't therefore reduce your CPP retirement pension. So you take your total earnings, uh, up, drop out whichever periods apply to you, take your total remaining earnings uh, divided by your total remaining contributory period and you calculate your average monthly pensionable earnings. Take 25% of that and you've got your CPP retirement pension. Uh, that used to be all of it. Now that that is now known as your basic amount of your benefit. And then you calculate in, if you've got any contributions in 2019 and beyond, they're considered within your basic calculation. And they'll also, you'll uh, calculate an enhanced portion that gets added to that basic portion. Uh, mm -hmm. And as I say, 40 years from now, that will bring, if you were, it'll bring your benefit up to 33.33% of your average monthly pensionable earnings. So people are getting a benefit from the enhanced. It's just a little, it'll yeah. cook it up just a slightly. So yeah, I, I wanna... in 2019, if you put in maximum earnings, it'll increase your benefit by about $1.47 a month. And that's 15% of the ultimate increase. So uh, once we're five years into it, each year of maximum earnings uh, under the enhanced, will increase your benefit by about $10 a month. Whereas prior to that, each year of maximum earnings was worth about a $30 towards a CPP, age 65 CPP retirement pension. Now there's something I picked up on there that I do want to come back to, because this is something we get all the time. And it was actually pointed out to me by my mother-in-law of all people. Uh, okay. she, she actually worked for the provincial government and did consulting with people on uh, transition out of the government and this kind of thing. She pointed out to me that getting on CPP disability can result in a higher retirement CPP down the road, as opposed to if you didn't get on, so if, if you were eligible to do the CPP disability, but you didn't take it and just stayed it off, off work, you get more of a retirement pension by getting the CPP disability. Does that make sense? That's a hundred percent accurate. Yeah. Your mother-in-law was correct. Yeah. Cause again, the CPP retirement pension is based on your average lifetime earnings. So if you've got a year of zero earnings uh, and you're not receiving the CPP disability, that brings down your average lifetime earnings. Uh, so it brings down your eventual retirement pension. Uh, if you are receiving the CPP, that gets excluded. So it doesn't count as a year of earnings. It's just out of the equation at all. There's no earnings there, but it, there's no contributory period. So it doesn't reduce your average monthly pension earnings and therefore it doesn't reduce your retirement pension. Now it makes total sense because it's, it's this idea you're, you're not having all these zeros that are going to be lowering your average earnings. So it's, it's cause it's not intuitive. Intuitively people think, Ooh, if I access, usually when you access a pension earlier, you get less. Right. So I sure. guess the government did not want to penalize people for having a disability. I would assume that's part of the calculation there. Right, the same way that if you, there's some value to uh, raising a child. So right. if, if you take five years off work and, and don't work for five years while you're raising a child under age seven, we'll take that out of your contributory period and therefore it doesn't reduce your eventual retirement pension. Does it make, how big a difference does it make? Because. Uh, one of the things that comes up is people, a lot of people getting CPP disability are also getting insurance, long disability yeah. insurance. Yeah. Uh, like one of the issues people have is, yeah, I'll get approved for my CPP disability, but I don't see any of that money because, in, well, yeah. they see it, but their long-term disability will be reduced dollar for dollar. So a lot of them are wondering, 
is it really like, am I going to save enough? Like, is it sometimes they're losing out on taxes because the long-term yeah. disability was non-taxable, the CPP is. So I always try to tell people, look, you, it'll probably be more, but I have no idea to tell them like, is it a big enough to make a difference? Uh, yeah. What if you're 60 versus what if you're 30? Like, I got to, like, when, when does it really make a difference? Or is that even something you can answer? I don't know. Well, uh, again, the CPP, it used to be the CPP was based on your best 40 years. Now it's your best 39 years because they, they increased the general dropout from 15% to 17%. So you can drop out eight years instead of seven years. So it means if your earnings are average, if you take it at age 65, your earnings are averaged over 39 years. If if nothing else is, is in, if you don't have the disability dropout or, or the child grant dropout. So that means that each year is worth about 2.5% of your eventual pension. Okay. So each year of zero earnings that you add to your lifetime record, if you can't drop it out under either the general dropout or the, the disability dropout or the child rearing dropout, it's going to reduce your average monthly pension earnings by 2.5% and therefore reduce your pension by 2.5%. So if you're eligible for a thousand dollar pension, it's going to reduce it by $25. So each year of zero earnings. And, and I said earlier that he, that the maximum pension right now is 1175.83. That's the maximum retirement pension. If you divide that by the 39 years that go into making up that calculation, you'll see that each year is now worth about $30 mm -hmm. per month towards a, a, a age 65 retirement pension. So if you uh, if you become disabled at age 60 uh, and you already had some low income years at the beginning of your contributory period, if if you don't apply for a CPP disability pension and you're just adding zeros, that could reduce your pension by about $130 uh, dollar, or 130 times five hundred and fifty dollars, uh, which is, a, in my opinion, a fairly significant decrease. Uh, whereas if you apply for your uh, disability at age 60 and apply for your CPP disability, it just gets excluded and you could get a maximum pension. So uh, approximately $30 for each year that you have zero earnings and decide not to apply for a CPP dis disability, that's how much you could be reducing your eventual retirement. There's never one answer for everybody, but it does it's this idea that it does make a big difference. And I, I hadn't even thought of that because it might only be these three or four years now, but you've got to remember, you might have those other th years earlier that are also right. non-contributory. So it's not just these three now, it's like, that might be fine if you don't have any missing years, but if you've got a lot of zeros in the back, yeah, that makes, that sure. makes total yeah, sense. If, if you started working right at age 18 and you've had maximum earnings for 39 years, then it, and you become disabled, you're already eligible for a maximum retirement pension. So you could have five years of zero earnings and they don't hurt you at all. Whereas somebody else, as I say, it could, the maximum, and it could be even more if, if you were uh, a parent and, and you've dropped off 10 years, say you had two children born three years apart, you potentially could drop out 10 years uh, under the child rearing provision instead of having your uh, lifetime uh, earnings averaged over 39 years, you might have them averaged over 30 years. Yeah. So that yeah. makes each year more valuable still. So it could be worth $40 a, a month. So it, again, if, if you're eligible for the child rearing dropout, it might even be more important that you apply for a disability pension because each year of zero uh, is averaged over less time and, and uh, becomes more valuable. Does it ever make sense for someone if having the choice between um, they're, they're approaching 60, they have the choice to apply for CPP disability or just they, maybe they've heard how hard that is. It's going to be a nuisance. Maybe I'll just get my regular CPP early at age 60. Is there ever a situation where it's better to just go the route of get your early CPP and just forget about the disability? Is that ever, because I'm asked that and I say, I usually tell people, no, like it's in my mind, it's always better to get the CPP disability if you can. 
Yeah. But I don't know if that is actually correct. Financially, that would certainly right. be correct. Uh, if you apply for it early, you're taking 64, you're taking a 36% reduction if you apply for it at age 60. So you're, you're receiving 64% uh, of, of your calculated retirement pension if you take it early. Whereas if you take the disability, if you're eligible for it, uh, while you're on disability, you're getting 75%, which is already more than the 64%, plus you're getting $500 a month flat rate benefit. Mm -hmm. Plus when you reach age 65, now you're getting the 100%. You, you're not reduced. So instead of taking 64% for a lifetime, you've got almost double that while you're on disability and then you're getting the hundred percent at age uh, 65 so no it, it would if you're eligible for the cpp disability you know if you think you you've only got a partial disability and you could do some type of work and, and therefore you don't qualify for the cpp disability then apply for the but you don't feel well enough to to go back to work uh, full-time for sure yeah. Yeah. then you you can take the CP, early CPP retirement pension. But financially, if your condition qualifies you for a CPP disability, financially, you'll always be much better off. And, and you can, if you need the income, you say, I, I can't afford to live, so I need to apply for the CPP retirement. You can apply for both of them simultaneously uh, and receive the, and the CP disability typically takes much longer to to uh, determine whether you're eligible for it. So, whereas the retirement pension can be processed immediately, subject to the file on the person's desk. But so you can receive some money, and then if you're approved for the disability, they'll just recover. They'll approve the disability and recover any CPP retirement pension paid to you from your first uh, payment of CPP disability. So it, it's not a bad thing to apply for it, but uh, apply for them both simultaneously. A thing that comes up, what if somebody is on CPP disability or they've opted for, say, the early retirement at 60? What if they keep working? Does that, and they earn enough, because I know a CPP disability is, you know, you can earn up to $5,000, $6,000, sometimes even more, and they'll allow you to stay on CPP disability but you're also continuing to pay in, you know, you potentially could still be paying into CPP disability. So what happens for people who choose to work part-time and maybe earn enough money that, uh, and again, maybe you can mention if, if you know when, when do people, when, how much do you have to earn that you're still paying into CPP? Like what happens to people who are still working and drawing either CPP disability or early retirement? Well, if you're drawing CPP disability, you shouldn't be paying CPP contributions because your contributory period has been interrupted. If you're on CPP disability, that period of time is excluded. So even if you made CPP contributions, they should get refunded to you. If they reach the point in time uh, that's above what they call the allowable earnings. And I think that's a, around $6,000 that you can earn without reporting to uh, Service Canada that you've even had the earnings. If you've regained capacity, you should be, whether you have earnings or not, you should be reporting and then your disability would stop. So it shouldn't happen that people make any further CPP contributions while they're on CPP disability and if they do make them, if they've got a part-time job and if the, the employer withholds contributions, those should get refunded at tax time when the person shows a T4 slip that I'm, I'm on CPP disability and I made it $100 CPP contribution that should get refunded. But if they had $20,000 worth of earnings and made yeah. CPP contributions and that like the, the test for CPP disability is not whether you have a certain disease or a condition, it's how mm -hmm. that condition affects your ability to work. So if you prove that you're capable of working despite having a condition that might otherwise qualify you, you've proven that you're not eligible and, and therefore they will cancel your CPP disability benefit and, and then the contributions would be 
credited at, based on your earnings and, and they'd eventually be used to calculate any subsequent benefit that you're entitled for. Uh, but the, the question you were getting at, I, I think, was around the, what's known as the post-retirement benefits. And that certainly applies if you're receiving a CPP retirement pension. So either an early retirement pension prior to age 65 or after age 65. Any earnings and contributions that you make after you're in receipt of a CPP retirement pension will create a post-retirement pension. And the value of that post-retirement pension is basically equivalent to what the value would have been towards calculating a retirement pension. It's basically 1 40th of the maximum benefit for the year adjusted by your age as of January of the year following the earnings. So again, a little bit complicated, but basically saying if you had maximum earnings for a year after you're already receiving a retirement pension, that will generate a post-retirement benefit equal to about $30 adjusted by your age adjustment factor. So if you're still under age 65, it'll be a little less than $30 a month. Uh, if you're over age 65, it'll be a little more than $30 a month added to you, whatever your retirement pension was prior to that. And that's payable for life. Uh, so it increases basically each year of earnings the same way if you hadn't applied for your retirement pension, each year of earnings would be factored into the calculation of your eventual benefits. This just gets calculated in a year at a time and added to your retirement pension. I, that's interesting because I had on my sheet here to make sure I ask you about the post-retirement. So just to be clear, so people aren't confused, post-retirement benefits, very different from what we talked about the enhanced CPP uh, earlier. What was, do you know that post-retirement of my little research came back that it started around 2012. Do you know that what was the purpose of this? Why did they start this post-retirement thing? Well, prior to there being the post-retirement benefit, once you were in receipt of a CPP retirement pension, you just couldn't pay in any longer. Right. So you wouldn't be contributing to the CPP. There was no post-retirement benefit because you couldn't make contributions. So it's just a way of acknowledging. And again, there used to be a test for whether or not you're still working. You couldn't receive an early CPP retirement pension if you were still working. So they removed the earnings test. They said, oh, just make it based on age now if you want to. Because it was sort of a fake test anyway. You had to be stop working for two months or something because a person could always decide, well, two years, I, I retired, and now I need to get back into the workforce, either because I'm bored and I need something to do or I need some income. So they'd go back to work later and, and not contribute. So it, it was a way of looking at, okay, uh, does it make sense that if somebody's, just because somebody's receiving a retirement pension, they shouldn't pay in any longer? Uh, and so... It was just a part of that decision. To, once you're receiving a benefit, do you pay in or not? And if you're going to pay in, you have you have to get something for it. So they created the post-retirement benefit. That makes total sense. So I guess to the nutshell, then, if you are not on CPP disability, if you've just retired and you're under age 65, maybe even up to age 70, I'm not sure you can continue to pay in. If, you, if you're getting a benefit and you're working, you will still get the benefit of working and paying in, I guess. It's not like lost money just going out the window to, to pay for the CPP or whatever. Yeah, no, no. So up to age 65, it's mandatory that if you're uh, working, you must pay CPP contributions. Mm -hmm. After age 65, if you're in receipt of a CPP retirement pension, you can opt out of making further contributions and then in which case you don't earn post-retirement benefits or you can stay in and make contributions and, and receive a post-retirement benefit. If you're over age 65 and you've decided to defer your CPP benefits, you're not going to apply, then you don't get a choice. You must still contribute as well up to age 70. Uh, if you haven't decided to take your retirement pension. So you need to meet the, there's the two factors. You need to be over age 65 and you need to be receiving your CPP retirement pension if you want to opt out of uh, 
making further CPP contributions. And again, you may not know the answer to this, but I, I run across the issues where, um, and actually someone asked me about this recently, there's this idea that your CPP disability stops once you turn 65. Most of the language on the, on the Service Canada site says that it just automatically converts over to a retirement um, but what if someone didn't want to re return, uh, you know, convert it over to retirement? Would they just, I'm, I'm assuming it's not mandatory, but maybe it is. I have no, I'm not even sure if you know the answer to that. So as someone who is on disability up to age 65, is it mandatory that the next month they start getting their CPP retirement or could they delay that? I'm not sure why they would want to, but I'm just wondering. Yeah. If well, it is an issue. Uh, under the legislation, uh, a CPP disability pension will end at age 65, and it will convert automatically to a retirement pension. There's always been an ability to cancel any CPP benefit of any type, as long as you do so within six months of receiving the first payment of that benefit. Uh, and repay any monies received mm -hmm. from that benefit. So, um, and what's prompted it, I think, is, is the increase in the uh, amount of the age adjustment factor for people who, who start their CPP after age 65. It used to be when they brought in flexible retirement pensions, uh, if you took it early or, or waited late, it was increased or decreased by half of 1%. Uh, and uh, probably 10 years ago now, they increased the, f the two factors so that uh, if you take it early, it's reduced by a higher factor. It's reduced by 0.6%. So it used to be a 30% reduction if you took it at age 60. Now it's a 36% reduction. Uh, and they also increase the factor even higher if you defer it. So it used to be 0.5% per month for a 30% increase. Now it's 0.7% per month for up to a 42% increase if you defer till age 70. So it can, it, it has a much bigger impact on the amount of your benefit. So certainly I've had some people uh, approach me, how it, can I do it first of all? Uh, and so you've always been able to do it if you let your disability end, uh, receive your first payment of retirement pension, and then you have to request in writing that your retirement pension be canceled. Uh, and, and then they'll, they'll accept that. There's no reason why they wouldn't accept the request to cancel as long as it's in writing and within six months of receiving your first retirement pension benefit then they'll write to you and say, okay, we've canceled your benefit. Uh, you've received two months payments or one month payment. You have to repay that amount within a further six months. And if you do so, the retirement pension, because the, under the legislation, again, it was deemed that by reaching age 65, you had applied for your retirement pension. They had approved it, it had happened. Uh, so now that's been withdrawn and you can reapply at any point in the future for your retirement pension. Uh, it'll be calculated and, and based on the age adjustment factor at that point in time. So that's always been possible. Service Canada seems to be getting a little more flexible in saying, why make you go through that whole process of actually letting it end and convert to a retirement pension? Why don't we allow you to contact us six months in advance of the disability ending and request that it never happen so they don't have to send you a payment, make you write in uh, and, and repay and stuff like that. So sometimes they seem to be accepting a request in advance that it not convert to a retirement pension, that it just end at age 65 and you'll apply at some point in the future. So I don't know what they've done in regards to a policy. Uh, there's been no legislative change that I'm aware of, but sometimes it seems to depend on who you get when you contact them, whether they will or won't allow you to cancel it in effect in advance or whether they're going to make you receive that first payment and cancel it after the fact. But if that's what you want, you can do it. On one hand, people might say, well, why would anyone ever want to just not get it? Well, if you've already got all your max years in, having four years of zeros is not going, or will the four years of zeros between 65 and 70, would that 
factor in, let's say you had less than your 39 years max, can like waiting actually hurt you because you're getting more of a, you know, you're getting more zeros on your denominator of your benefit period. Is that a factor? Not after age 65. There's a a further dropout that I refer to as the over age 65 dropout. (laughs) Any low income years after age 65 can't hurt you at all. Okay. So it is a benefit. It can be a big benefit because there's a big difference between waiting 65 and 70. So that's very, I, okay. I was not even aware of that. So there actually can be quite a motivation for someone to stop their disability when their disability stops at 65, if they have the means to wait and have their CPP. Sure. Even if you wait one year, it's an 8.4% increase in the benefit amount. Wow. It's 0.7% for every month you defer. Uh, and there's no impact on your uh, lifetime average earnings after age 65. If you were making this decision before age 65, you would have to consider, uh, you know, maybe my benefit amount is going to drop to 2.5%. I said, uh, I'm going to get 7.2% more, but it's dropping 2.5. So you, I refer, to, if, if you're making that decision from a retirement pension, I refer to that period as you're waiting to receive a larger slice of a smaller pie. Uh, But after age 65, your pie stays the same size and you're getting a bigger piece of it. So uh, there's financially, if you can afford to wait, the numbers aren't large that are getting to me, but I've had half a dozen or 10 people approach me to say, that's uh, I'm, I'm reaching age 65 and I'd, I'd like to not receive my retirement pension. Mm. Can I do it? And, and the answer is always, yes, it's just which process, right. whether you can do it in advance or, or whether you're going to have to wait till you receive that first retirement pension. But if you wait too long and you've received six months worth of payments, now you're locked into, you cannot cancel and withdraw uh, a benefit uh, once it, you've received six months of, of payment. I'd, I'd like to ask one of these urban legends because <laughs> I've heard this. People ask me, I'm like, I have no idea. I'm not the guy to ask. I'm a disability lawyer. I do not, I cannot answer pension. There's an urban myth and maybe it's true that, uh, that there's this idea that the timing of your application for retirement and CPP retirement, sometimes the difference of a month can mean a lot. Uh, or can make a difference that if you were to apply, say someone was going to apply, say this month in October, what if they waited until January of next year? There, like there's these ideas out there that if you just sometimes a month can make a world of difference. Uh, is there any truth to that idea? It doesn't usually make a significant difference. It can sometimes make a bit of a difference. Part of the problem is a lot of the time you don't know until after the fact that the the choice was there or what the decision would have been. And and one of the factors that causes that is uh, I mentioned in talking about how a benefit is calculated, you bring all the earnings up to a current year value. That's based on uh, the benefit. The earnings are always escalated based on the five-year average YMP ending with the year the benefit is uh, put into pay. Uh, So the YMPE is increasing each year based on average industrial wage is is what it's tied to. So any wage increases drive an increase in in the YMPE, but then that gets muted a little bit because it's averaged over five years. So wages might have gone up a lot this year, uh, so the YMPE goes up accordingly, but in escalating the earnings up to a current year value, that gets muted a little bit because the YMP gets averaged over five years. Whereas once a benefit is in pay, it gets indexed annually based on price increases as measured by the consumer price index. So some years prices go up higher than wages and and maybe having a benefit in pay in December and then getting the CPI increase is a favorable decision. Whereas other years, the wages might have gone up more. And if you wait from December to January, it would have been a higher amount than if you had started in December and had taken the, uh, the increase. But, but often they don't release these figures, uh, 
the CPP, the CPI increase and the YMP increase until it's too late. Gee, I wish I'd known that in December and had applied in December, but now I'm, I'm into January already. For a retirement pension, at least anyway, you can't apply retroactively unless you're over age 65. So if you're in the 60 to 64, when you apply the earliest your pension can start is the month following. So if you applied in November, your benefit can start in December. But if you apply in December, you, the earliest your benefit could start is January. Uh, so once they, and they often don't release the CPI increase until sometime into December. If you know how it's calculated, you could do the calculation yourself because uh, they release the, the figures that go into that calculation earlier, but they don't reduce uh, release the, the net figure until it's too late to uh, make the decision. But, but usually we're talking about maybe a dollar per month, uh, maybe two dollars per month. We're not talking 20 or 30 dollars a month where you would be better off applying. So usually it's a fairly minor uh, amount. When should they go get advice is what I'm thinking about here. Like, um, is it if they've stopped working already, is it more critical to make a decision on the CPP right away? Because I think it would depend on their situation, how many years they have in. Because I would assume once they stop working, if they actually retired, now they're going to start tacking on zeros. And it mm -hmm. could, they could, could someone do themselves harm if they stop working, haven't really thought this through and just think, well, my CPP will continue to build because if I don't take it for another 70, then it's just going to keep getting bigger. But that's not always the case, right? Or at least that's my understanding is that if you retire and stop earning an income, you shouldn't just assume that if you wait and get your CPP, you're going to get more. Now, you, maybe yeah. you could get, tell me the answer on that one. You, you will always get more if you wait because the, the increase for the age adjustment factor mm -hmm. it all, will always exceed any decrease for the uh, additional years of zero earnings. Because again, each, each year of uh, the age adjustment factor at a minimum is going to increase you by... 0.6% per month or 7.2% per year. And as I say, typically each year of earnings is worth about 2.5%. So you're going down 2.5%, but you're increasing by 7.2%. But so you'll always get more, but you won't get as much more as you might have if you had kept working. And again, it depends a little bit on your lifetime average earnings. Are they at maximum or near maximum? or are they fairly low? If you're working and earning, you're now at the end of your career and earning the best dollars. So working another year, it could be going up. Your average lifetime earnings could be going up with each year of additional earnings. So you're getting both the increase for the higher average earnings and for the age adjustment factor. Uh, so th there's a number of times when it would be a good decision to consult and, and, and know what the impact is. One, one trigger might be, okay, I've decided to stop working. What's going to happen to my CPP? Should I take it immediately? Or am I safe waiting? Uh, how much more will it, what will it be the net increase? That would be one trigger. But sometimes before you've stopped working, like you shouldn't do your retirement planning once you've stopped working. That's, that's not a great time to start planning. So it, it's a better idea at, at age 45, 50, where you've still potentially got 10 years of earnings ahead of you. Before you make the decision to stop working, it's good to know what you're going to have in the way of income streams once you stop working. So age 45 to 50 is probably a better time to be doing some of this retirement planning rather than 62 when you've pulled the plug already and, and you've decided to stop. But it's better to still get the advice then than, than wait till age 65 and say, whoops, I, I, I got my statement from CPP. It, it told me I could get $1,100 if I was age 65, but you weren't age 65, you were age 62. That $1,100 might decrease. It's not that your benefit amount will decrease from because it never was going to be that that 1175 unless you had kept working. That's one of the, the things is that the estimates on the CPP statement of contributions, the SOC or their online are, are based on a calculation 
as of a benefit starting the month following when that calculation is done. So if you're 40 years old when that calculation is done, it pretends that you're age 65 month following the statement, which has the same effect as projecting whatever your current lifetime average earnings are from age 18 to 40. It in effect projects that for another 25 years to age 65. It, it doesn't really add in earnings, but, but it has the same impact as having done so. Makes a smaller difference if you're age 62, you're just three more years, but that three years of zero earnings could decrease the 1175 down to about 1080, or it could stay the same. It's, it's not gonna go up. It can't possibly go up uh, if you're adding zero earnings. Uh, your calculated retirement pension, but it may, so it could go down or it could remain the same. Glad you brought up the statement of contribution. So I meant to ask you when we were talking about how people can know what their amount might be that they would get. So what you were mentioning is there is a website that everyone can either get into or get access to. It's called My Service Canada. When you get in there, there's actually, I was in it this morning, just preparing for this, just to refresh myself, but there's a a button that says statement of contributions and you can click on that and it will actually show you what you've contributed into the program that shows you if you've hit the maximum years or not. And it will also give you, there's also a thing in there that gives you an estimate. And you've just talked about that. It gives you an estimate of if I retired at age 65, I looked at mine this morning. If I retired at 60, 65, 70, it gives an estimate of the CPP disability. If you wouldn't mind circling back around, if someone wants to get a, so if someone say, I wonder what I'm going to get, I'm thinking of applying for CPP disability. If they go in there and just look at these numbers, say that I'm, say that I'm 50, I go in and look at these numbers. Can you just reiterate one more time, whether what these numbers actually show, because I, again, I told people those are not written in stone. There's some projecting going on here. So maybe just explain one more time. If people want to go in, how reliable is it to go in and see that information if you're thinking of retiring in the short term or doing disability in the short term? Like how reliable can you go with those numbers and when should you better go get some advice? Uh, those numbers are 100% accurate if child rearing dropout doesn't apply to you. Mm -hmm. And if you're eligible for the benefit effective the following month, right. which is what the calculations are based on. Uh, and, and when I say 100% accurate, what they don't include, they only include the earnings shown so that typically right now we're in uh, October of 2020. Uh, so the 2019 earnings will be there, should be there for sure. They typically show up uh, around May. They, they used to always show up when your income tax return uh, was assessed by Revenue Canada. Now, now they sometimes show up er, uh, earlier because employer, uh, employers are submitting electronic information to Revenue Canada, and that will sometimes get posted even before. But so getting around March, April, May uh, of any year, the previous year's earnings will show. So the calculation right now, if done, wouldn't include any 2020 earnings. So if you were working this year, that could increase your whatever is shown, could increase it a little, or it might not. Again, it depends on whether your earnings are above or below your current lifetime average earnings, whether it will increase or, or decrease. Uh, your, your benefit estimate. So again, you, following that same logic, uh, the estimate for disability should be fairly accurate uh, if you're already disabled. Uh, and again, you could have become disabled uh, a year ago or something. The, the biggest thing with the disability estimate is there's two factors to, to it. First of all, you have to meet, you have to have contributions for the minimum qualifying period, uh, which is either four out of the last six years or 25 years in total, plus three of those being within the last six. We were talking earlier offline about the late applicant provision. Uh, so you, you could be, your statement could show zero for your CPP disability because there's five years of zero earnings because you, you've been disabled, so you haven't got earnings. Uh, and now the statement is saying you're not eligible for any uh, CPP disability benefits. So it could be misleading in that way because 
if under the late applicant provision you've been disabled, and that's why you've got zero years earnings. So you could be eligible for a benefit and, and you won't know what the amount is. You could do a, a bit of a, uh, a projection if, if you look at what the uh, retirement pension says you would be eligible for at age 65. Mm -hmm. And then if you took 75% of that figure and added in the flat rate, you'd get to a reasonably accurate CPP disability if you knew that you met the uh, criteria under the late applicant provision. So that's sort of around the disability. On the retirement side, again, uh, because they pretend that you're eligible effect of the following month, uh, it has the same impact as projecting your current lifetime average earnings. So if your current earnings are in, and plan for the future are higher than your lifetime average, that SOC estimate is going to be too low. Uh, and if you're planning to, gee, I was going to stop working. Like I've had a 45-year-old person uh, approach me and say, gee, uh, my SOC is saying I'm eligible for the maximum benefit. Does that mean if I don't pay in for the next 20 years, I'm actually going to receive a retirement pension? Uh, no, you have to maintain that same maximum earnings average for 80 or sorry, 83 percent of the remaining. Uh, you don't have to do it right from age 45 to 65 because you're going to get to drop out your lowest approximately three to four years of that period. But you'd need maximum earnings for about 17 of those remaining 20 years in order to stay at a maximum benefit. Uh, so, and if you had 20 years of zeros, your benefit would drop from the 1175 down to about $600 because you'd got 20 years of zeros out of your 40 year uh, period that counts. What if that person, that 45 year old was, had a disability and qualified for CPP, would it lock in that high number? Yes, it would. Right. That's, that's the, that's the key point of this whole thing. Yeah. It would lock it in. Because all those future years now get dropped out. You're yeah. locked in on that number. You get the high CPP disability amount because it's based on the maximum. They've achieved the maximum. So this is why the CPP disability is such a great program for people um, because it locks in your work up until that point. I guess it's, yeah. I don't know if locking and locking it in is the right word, but um, it, you get kind of credit for it. Yeah, yeah, no, I think it's a good word. It brings up one, one other small point that I perhaps should mention, uh, and, and, and that's sort of the, the maximum. The, the published maximum is always the, uh, the amount, the maximum that a benefit would be if it starts in this year. And I mentioned earlier that there's a, that's based on the YMP, which is tied to wages and stuff like that. Once a benefit goes into pay, it's no longer uh, indexed based on the YMPE increases. It's indexed based on CPP, CPI increases, consumer price index increases, because it's thought that, okay, you got you to gotta keep pace now with price increases, not with wage increases any longer because you're not working any longer. But what that sometimes does is, again, if, if there's a difference between those two factors, is that if you re start receiving a maximum disability benefit at age 45 and, and remain disabled until age 65, that'll convert to a maximum pension, but it may or may not be exactly the same as a, a maximum benefit that starts that 20 years later. Because if there's been a difference uh, of the indexing of wages versus prices, you could be slightly above or slightly below the maximum for a benefit if it had started in that year. So again, some people get a little concerned that that if uh, their benefit has, has now at 1150 and they say, hey, wh why is that less than somebody who's who's started contributing now? Basically, I try and exp I, I often don't try and justify why legislation exists. My, my intent is to make them aware of, of what's happening rather than justifying whether it's fair or not. But the thought is, okay, you haven't contributed for those last 20 years, uh, and it's more important that your purchasing power remain comparable 
rather than you, you've kept up with wage increases that you weren't part of anyway, sort of thing. It, it makes sense to me that once a benefit is paid, that in, it gets linked to any increases, get linked to price increases rather than wage increases. So sometimes there's, a, and the same thing, ha it's not just with disability, you'll have people receiving a retirement pension w was maximum three years ago, and now they're getting slightly above or below maximum. And, and they like it if prices have gone up higher and now they're getting more than, th then the, the people get concerned the other way is that, how come my max, I've paid in three years longer and I'm getting less than somebody who started their benefit three years ago. But it's just because there is that little bit of a disparity that until a benefit goes into pay, it's linked to wage increases. Once a benefit is in pay, it's linked to price increases. Somehow we've been talking about pensions for an hour here. Right. <laughs> Time flies by. That is hard to believe. I was telling my wife, she's like, how are you going to talk about pensions for an hour? I'm like, it is not going to be a problem. I guarantee you. There's right. no end to this. And it's like a rabbit hole. Uh, Doug, uh, we'll bring it to an end here now. Is there any other, um, well, first of all, where can people reach you? Um, and if people want to, if people wanted to hire you or, or reach out to you, where would they find you? What's the best way to get in touch with you? Best way is, is online. My email address, drpensions at shaw.ca uh, or check out my uh, website, drpensions.ca. Uh, or Google, Google Doug Runchy and, and you'll find me pretty easily. One other thing that I, I wanted to, to mention uh, before we uh, go off air is just one of the things that I get uh, uh, questions on fairly often is when a person's receiving CPP disability and they're approaching age 65, they want to know what, how much is my retirement pension going to be? Right. Yep. Uh, and that's not typically a calculation that I will charge for because it's a very simple calculation that everybody can do themselves. And it's for, for two reasons. It's because the disability, the calculation of a retirement pension when it's converting from a disability is slightly different from where, where a disability pension is, is not involved for two reasons. One is because the contributory period is excluded while they were on disability. And secondly, uh, if they're receiving a disability beyond age 60, when their retirement pension is calculated, it's not based on escalating the earnings up till age 65 and doing the calculation then. It's escalating the earnings up to the year that their disability started and then indexing based on price increases since then. Let's use the example of somebody again at age 45 that became disabled and they've continued to be disabled till age 65. Since their benefit when it converts will be calculated based on their earnings escalated till age 45 uh, based on the YMPE and based on CPI increases since then, then all they have to do to estimate how much their retirement pension is going to be on conversion is re reverse the steps, calculate their benefit, subtract the flat rate benefits. So subtract the 505.79 from your current disability benefit, divide that result by 75% or divide by 0.75 and you'll get what your retirement pension plan will be. Your retirement benefit would be at age 65. So it's that simple. Uh, you can do it the complicated way by escalating your earnings up to the year you turn 45, excluding the contributory period, dividing by taking the 25%, and you should get to the same answer or within pennies of the same answer. So it's a two-step process. Take your disability benefits, subtract the flat rate benefit, divide by 75% or divide by 0.75, and the result is your retirement pension at age 65. <laughs> I hope you listen to the end, folks, because that is the that is the golden nugget of this whole thing. Wow. So it is it is literally you can reverse engineer it and have a, a pretty good confidence that that's going to be fairly accurate or yeah. exactly accurate. Doug, I can't I can't thank you enough for this. I really appreciate. Um, I don't think you were like a secret. Uh, 
when you came out, I, I literally did call it the caramel secret. I don't think it was yeah. like you said, it wasn't a government state secret of how CPP is calculated, but you were the first one to really start educating the public about CPP disability, how it's calculated or CPP retirement and disability, how it's calculated. I right. really am grateful to you for that. And this video has been fantastic. And this little nugget at the end, and I do wish you the best and thank you so much for doing this. Oh, thanks for having me on.